The three or four to let boards had stood within the low paling as long as the inhabitants of the little triangular square could remember. They now overhung the palings, each at its own angle, and resembled nothing so much as a row of wooden choppers ever in the act of falling upon some passer-by. For six months, Oleron had passed on his way from his lodgings. He chanced one morning to pause before one of the inclined boards. The board bore, besides the agent's name, the announcement that the key was to be had at number six. I'm Barrett, the agent for it. Oleron asked if he might have the key of the old house. You won't need the key. The entrance door isn't closed, and a push will open any of the others, he said. If you're thinking of taking it. night later, his first floor was painted throughout. The ceilings were lofty and faintly painted. Oleron walked about with the mere pleasure of the glimpses from white room to white room. As far as the chief business of his life, his writing, was concerned, Paul Oleron treated the world a good deal better than he was treated by it. He had chosen his path and was committed to it beyond the possibility of withdrawal. In the meantime, his removal into the old house merely interrupted Romilly Bishop at the 15th chapter. But he worked badly. He stared about his room, then got up and began pacing around his new lodgings. At one end of the apartment was a large closet with a door. Oleron found a couple of mushroom-shaped old wooden wig stands. He did not know how they had come to be there. Then he drew out something yielding, unfolded, and furred over an inch thick with dust. It was some sort of large bag of an ancient, frieze-like material. He folded the object up carelessly and thrust it into a corner of the kitchen. The square outside had its own noises, frequent and new. piqued Oleron a little, that his friend, Miss Bengough, should dismiss with a glance the place he himself had found so singularly winning. But then she had always been more or less like that, a little indifferent to the graces of life and careless of appearances. Well, what do you think of the new place? 
Oleron asked. I don't know. I liked the last place, in spite of the black ceiling and no heating. How's Romilly? Hmm. The fact is, I've not got on very well with it. I'm now thinking of reconstructing the whole thing. Reconstructing? Are you serious? Miss Bengoff asked presently, with a round-eyed stare. He began to show Miss Bengough around his flat. She made few comments. In the kitchen, she asked what an old faded square of frieze was. I was hoping you could tell me what it is, Oleron replied, as he related the story of its finding. It's being used to wrap up a harp, said Miss Bengough, before putting it in its case. You're right! said Oleron. I could make neither head nor tail of it. They finished the tour of the flat and returned to the sitting room. I'll tell you what I think of it. Go on. You'll never work here. Well, said Oleron quickly. Why not? You'll never finish Romilly here. I don't know why, but you won't. I know it. You'll have to leave before you get on with that book, she replied. I can only hope you're wrong, he said. I shall be in a mess if Romilly isn't out in the autumn. For ten minutes and more he sat, still gazing into the fire, with that humiliating red fading slowly from his cheeks. All was still, within and without, save for a tiny musical tinkling that came from his kitchen. The dripping of water from an imperfectly turned off tap into the vessel beneath it. Mechanically, he began to beat with his fingers to the faintly heard falling of the drops. The tiny, regular movement seemed to hasten that shameful withdrawal from his face. He rose fetched the fifteen chapters and read them over before he should drop them in the fire. But instead of putting them in the fire, he let them fall from his hand. He became conscious of the dripping of the tap again, Following the lowest note, there seemed to be a brief phrase, irregularly repeated. Presently, Oleron found himself waiting for the recurrence of this phrase. It was quite pretty. As he felt this growing attachment to the fabric of his abode, Elsie Bengoff began to show a dislike of the place that was more and more marked. He was not conscious that when Elsie arrived that morning, he hummed the air. Dear me, the soft falsetto rose, but that's a very old tune. It's called The Beckoning Fair one. 
it was sung to a harp. There was a pause. Then Elsie asked, How's Romilly coming along, Paul? The manuscript. I was on the point of burning it, but I didn't. It's in that window seat if you must see it. Miss Bengough crossed quickly to the window seat and lifted the lid. Suddenly, she gave out an exclamation. He hurried her to the bathroom and bathed and cleansed the bad gash, uttering broken phrases of astonishment and concern. There was one spot in particular of his abode that he began to haunt with increasing persistency. He had discovered one day that by opening every door in his place and by placing himself on this particular spot, he could actually see into each of his five rooms without changing his position. Suddenly, his meditation went. His ear had become conscious of that soft and repeated noise. A sort of sweeping rustle that seemed to hold an almost inaudible, minute crackling again and again. It seemed to Oleron that it grew louder. All at once he started bolt upright in his chair, tense and listening. The silky rustle came again. He was trying to attach it to something. God in heaven! He spent that afternoon in a delicious vacancy, smiling now and then as if in sleep, and ever lifting drowsy and contented eyes to his alluring surroundings. He lay thus until darkness came, and the nocturnal noises of the old house. As time went on, it came to pass that few except the postman mounted Oleron stairs, and since men who do not write letters receive very few, even the postman's tread became so infrequent that it was not heard more than once or twice a week. And if all else was falling away from Oleron, gladly he was letting it go. So do we all when our fair ones beckon. Quite at the beginning we wink and promise ourselves that we will put her ladyship through her paces. Neglect her for a day turn her own jealous wiles against her, flout and ignore her when she comes home weedly. Perhaps there lurks within us, all the time, a heartless sprite who is never fooled. But in the end, all falls away. She beckons, beckons, Beckons and all.
Chicago. He heard a voice outside on the landing. Hold. It was Elsie's voice. Hold. He cursed her under his breath but kept perfectly still. He did not intend to admit her. With his teeth hard to set, he dropped the first page of Romilly into the fire. Then he began to drop the rest in, sheet by Gradually, his power was draining away. He thought he heard a sound from the kitchen or bathroom. He rose a little on his pillow and listened. Ah, he was not alone then. A short, stifled, spluttering cry rang sharply out. Paul! It came from the kitchen. Who's that? He called out sharply from his bed. He had no answer. This time, he was sure he heard noises. Soft and heavy in the kitchen. There was a sound as of a closing door, and then silence. Oleron began to get rather alarmed. He let go the wall and fell back into bed again as other half of that kiss that a Nash had interrupted was placed on his lips, robbing him of breath. Two officers made their way into the house. Upstairs was the cupboard with a square panel. One of the officers advanced and slid the hatch along the groove. Then he took an involuntary step back again. Framed in the aperture was something that resembled a large, lumpy pudding, done up in a pudding bag of faded frieze.
They got him down the stairs and along the alley. The mortuary lay that 